Uh, for those of you who haven't, haven't been here before, uh, this is a, a many, many hours, and, and there's a gentleman here named uh, Mel Lulavaka that spent many, many hours as one of the founders and, and uh, putting all of this together. I remember when he and I I'm one of the volunteers, Terry Torres, Jay Pollard, our baker, and also Beverly Peekable. Anyway, so just a brief history about uh, what, what this effort is. It's, it's an accumulation of artifacts and stories from, oh, from, from the beginning of, of the Filipinos experience in the United States. So what, the, what we, we have done is we summarized the different waves of the migrations and I welcome everybody to come in and uh, but today we're going to have our monthly talk story, and we're, we're going to talk about the Aguayani village and, and the building of it. And, and I'd like to make sure that uh, people uh, see what, what this was done. I'm, I'm from Delano, and if if, uh, if if you know the geography of, of Aguayani village, it's on Barsis, Barsis Highway. And our, our uh, my dad's farm was about an eighth of a mile away from my grand village. So my brother Sam and I would, would be able to hear a lot of the uh, goings on and the, the, the types of things that were going to happen during the strike. Now, this top story is going to be based on, on the starting of the Aguayana village. And I'll let Jay Salar talk a little bit more about it. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. My granddaughter, Camila, and my grandson, Sebastian, my other grandson, uh, Silas. Uh, but thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, kind of surprised me when I donated a videotape to the museum that I got a text from Jay saying that they wanted to show it and include it as part of the, uh, oh. Do you mind if I take this off? Yeah. I'll try and stand back, because yeah. no. otherwise I'll faint from no air. No air. <clears throat> but I was surprised that they wanted to include it and honored also that they wanted to include it as part of the uh, Sundays at the museum series, so. So I have a few notes because, you know, I tend to forget a lot of stuff. Um, when I, when I retired, one of my projects was to, everybody has retirement projects, and one of them was to compile all these pictures that I had, all the videos, et cetera. Uh, I wanted to chronicle the history of my family, and specifically my mother and father. You know, my, my dad was like um, the monongs that came in the 20s. He came when he was 14 years old uh, with a couple of his cousins. They, went to San Francisco, met another cousin, and then they, they traveled up and down, you know, um, the Sacramento Valley for uh, going after the crops. Or, and then when the war came, he, he was in the 1st Philippine Infantry. He went back and then he met my mom. And so my mom, I never knew this until recently, my mom was a, a war bride. And I was always wondering why, you know, I'm from like a mixed family. Um, uh, Ilocano and Visayan. I could never understand that connection until I understood the story of the Filipino war brides. So I found a lot of these tapes 
And in those tapes, the old 8 millimeter and the old Super 8 millimeter, we had five reels from Agbayani Village, and I forgot we had taken those. So I put those together, and I wanted to do a video, and I, you'll hear it, um, I made two videos. One was shown, but it was more about, I don't know, it was more fluff than anything. It was just like uh, showcasing, I don't know, the rooftop. I probably, we probably took 20 minutes of the rooftop, which, you know, can get pretty boring. So I made the second one, and I think it has more substance. And what I wanted to do in this one, because it's not just about Agbayani Village, but it's also about Kayamangi, our student organization, Sac State. Because you can look at Sac State, not, or Kayamangi, not just as an entity unto its own, but you can look at it as a representative of the types of Filipino organizations at the colleges that were being established in the 60s and 70s. Uh, so I just want to give a few uh, historical bullet points so you could understand, or just so you can get a picture of where, where we were, the times we were in. But in the 60s, you know, there's, there are you know, several major events. You know, the assassination of President Kennedy, you had the Watts riots, you had the Detroit riots, and you had the Great Strike, started in 65 and uh, ended in 1970. Well, in the mid-60s, the black students at San Francisco State, they started demanding, and this is all out of the, the Civil Rights Movement, they started demanding, and they phrased it, a comprehensive and culturally responsive black studies department. So this was like the embryo of the ex ethnic studies departments throughout the colleges. Uh, the following year, the Third World Liberation Front at San Francisco State, supported by a coalition of black students, Native American, Latino, and Asian Americans, they led a strike pretty much demanding the formation of ethnic studies. <coughs> Excuse me. And so in March of 1968, SF State was the first college that had uh, ethnic studies program in the United States. And so other colleges started following suit, and the one at Sac State uh, started in 1970. So with, with that, there were, there were now at Sac State courses in uh, Latino studies, or Chicano studies, we called it back then, uh, Asian American studies, uh, Native American studies and black or native or African American studies. From that, Kayumungi started in 1972. <clears throat> and Kayumungi wasn't a social club, it was more an issue oriented club. Because if you look at the, the Asian American studies classes, because um, I took several of those, the they focused on the Asian American as a whole. There wasn't anything specific, or not, not anything, but there wasn't a lot of depth to the Filipino uh, experience in the United States. So one of the goals of Kayamangi was to develop an Asian or a, a Filipino American experience class. And I'm going to try not to say a lot of what you'll see on the, the videotape. I don't, don't want to repeat too much, and so that goes into it a little bit more. <clears throat> but Kayamungi, along with the class, we were also involved in different, different issues, different uh, projects that we had. One, there was a uh, housing project in Oakland called Project Manong that several of us had gone down to help, and they were, that was, they were renovating a, one of those old colonial buildings that had like six or seven bedrooms, so they were, developing it for senior housing for the monarchs. <clears throat> we had another project where we, we would go out to the Delta uh, during the holidays and we would set up a, uh, like a Christmas program that we showed to the monarchs that were in the different uh, camps. Uh, another one that we tried that went on for a couple of semesters was, uh, it was like a, a Filipino-American history school that we set up where we had, uh, we had elementary school students come 
it was like twice a week. We would come Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then we would teach them, you know, language, uh, teach them dance, talk about the history. Uh, I remember one time we were going to teach them cooking, and somebody was supposed to get the ingredients for a ginataan. Well, instead of getting brown sugar, they got they brought white sugar. So the ginataan wasn't brown or golden; it was white and. Somehow it just didn't look right, and it didn't taste right either. So. But the main, one of the major projects we were involved with was Agbayani, Agbayani Village. Now, Agbayani Village was a, uh, the vision of Larry Leon. He had recognized that the... He had, re he had recognized the plight of the senior Filipino farm workers, the Manongs the ones that had come in the 20s and 30s, that in the 60s, they were now nearing retirement age. They didn't have savings, they didn't own property. Uh, you know, they couldn't go home. A lot of them, they'd been gone from their homes for almost 50 years. They may not have had family, any family to go back to. So he had recognized that need. Uh, so he made it and as when the uh, grape strikes was over, they made that as one of the um, parts of the contract when they negotiated with the owners. And so uh, it got to where they were in agreement, the owners, as part of the collective bargaining, agreed to pay two cents for every box of grapes that were picked into a senior housing fund. And so that's how they were planning on funding the building of Agbayani Village. Well, for whatever reason, and I haven't seen any, anything that um, explained it, they never got any funding. Maybe there was no follow through, maybe it became a minor issue, but the issue of the retirement home for the Monoms is still there. You know, it, it didn't go away. So when they built Agbayani Village, it was being mainly based on donations. For instance, the uh, the blueprints were drawn up by an architectural firm in San Jose, and they donated that. They had electricians coming, electricians coming, you know, the different unions, carpenters, masonry, plumbers. They were all donating their time. Uh, a, a sizable uh, amount of money was donated by the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Foundation. So that probably went to purchase a lot of the materials, materials that they needed. Well, the way we got involved with it was after the strike, uh, Philip Veracruz was invited to go speak at SF State. And probably in that conversation with them, he talked about Agbani Village. And the students there said, well, what can we do? How can we help? And his response was, we need volunteers. We need people to come to help us carry the tile onto the roof. We need people to help us dig the trenches. We need people to help us, you know, put up the sheetrock and do the painting. So from that, the word got out, community groups, grassroots organizations, uh, college, you know, they came by the bus loads. And so uh, it was counted that over, over a thousand people went there. So Kayumangi, we made that, okay, that's one of the things we're gonna get involved with. And so we went down, we would leave like on a Friday after everybody got out of school or those at work got out of work. We'd bust down, or not bust down, we actually caravan down because we didn't have enough people for a bus. There were probably about 10, 15 of us. So we took cars down and uh, we'd arrive like midnight. We'd go stay at a, uh, the hall at a church. Next morning we'd wake up we go have breakfast at Shenley Camp. Shenley Camp was uh, one of the first companies that had settled, and it was their labor camp. But I didn't, you know, I don't understand the full details. But what happened was they they turned it over to the the I guess the UFW to where all the monoms that were going to live in Agbayani Village stayed there until the village was built, as well as the anchor crew that worked at Agbayani Village. They stayed at Shenley Camp also. Uh, let's see. 
So while the initial intent of me in doing the uh, video of Agbani Village, the, in, the initial intent was just to focus on Agbani Village. But I felt it was important, and I, from the interviews, it kind of steered it in that direction to where all of a sudden it dawned on me that it was just as important to tell the story of ethnic studies and Kayumangi as a representative of other Filipino student organizations and their involvement with Agbani Village. So, as my dad would say at these Filipino dances, uh, music maestro. So, so we're ready for it. <laughs>
traveled to Delano several times during the winter and spring of 1974 to volunteer with the construction. This is their story when they joined other volunteers in Delano, California. Enjoy this story of Filipino American history and the early Phil Am students who became involved in their community. Okay, thank you very much for coming to this. We're gonna have question and answers and if, you, if you'd like, you can oh. um, Yeah, any questions? But before I do, I wanna make some introductions. Um, there are some people on here you may have recognized. Some are from Stockton, and not everybody is, but some were. Uh, first of all, my wife, Chris, uh, she was on there working on the roof. And then Liz, Liz, you just want to raise your hand. Although she didn't uh, go to Ogbayani, she was a big part of Kayamungi uh, at Sac State. Uh, Vince, there are Vince's here. Okay. Vince and Remy. Oh, okay. Phil? Phil. Phil. Okay. <laughs> uh, anybody else from Kaima? I can't, with all the mass, I, plus I probably haven't seen you in 40 years, too. <laughs> so I, I don't recognize you, so that's a double whammy right there. So anybody else from Kaimangi that was on here? Marlene, I heard Marlene's here. Pedro Gosa? Melinda. Oh, Melinda, okay. Marlene's sister, Melinda. And then Gary, Vince's, Vince's brother. Okay. okay. Uh, so are there any, any questions uh, that anybody might have? Oh, one, one thing before you do that. Uh, I do want to note that all the, I don't do a lot of videos, but the ones I do, they're, I call them living documents. So I do research, but you know, a lot of times I, I might find stuff and it's incorrect. And so anything that I say or that I put on the videos, they're living documents. So if you've noticed anything on there, maybe the facts and figures are wrong, the dates are wrong, anything like that, you know, please let me know, and then I can correct it. Um, you know, this was from the initial one. This is probably like the fifth iteration of this particular video. I keep making updates. I'll wake up at 2.30 in the morning, and I'll go, oh shoot, that's wrong, and I'll make the change. So I, there's already two different changes from the copy that I donated to the museum from, from that one. So I was going to give them a copy of this one. So anyway, so if you see anything, just please let me know. Okay, question? Um, is there now and can we go visit? Uh, yeah, I think you can go visit. I know there are colleges that, you know, it's part of their curriculum, I guess. They'll take a field trip there. I but, think I can answer that one. Okay. No, there are there are the last the last monong that moved in, one of the original monongs, passed away in 1994 or 97, and his picture was on there uh, when it was flashing through all the some of the monongs that were there. So now my understanding is it's still providing low cost housing to single uh, single farm workers in the area. So there, you know, I I saw an interview that. Uh, from Cesar Chavez's son, where he said, from the time it opened until now, they probably had three to four thousand different residents staying there. So it's being used; it's not just just sitting sitting there. Okay. Yes. Does the um, the Aquanani village now is there a museum component in there to preserve some of that history? You mean at at the village itself? Um, there, it's possible. I don't know. There was one shot where it had a plaque with listing all the different, you know, the thousand volunteers over there. So it's possible they have something. I know 
uh, the photographer, he had put up a, a pretty good display. He, was t he took pictures of all the volunteers that went and had a big display. So I would imagine that would still be there somewhere. Because uh, that was part of the, I think they were proud that, that uh, there were so many people volunteering going there to help them out. And he was recording it all during that time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And there were quite a few people from Stockton that were part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Lee was a good, good guy, and I was sorry to hear that he had passed away. I never was able to make a reconnect with him after, after college. I guess he joined the service and things like that, but I never seen him since then. So it was good when we, you know, when I we went through all these tapes, and uh, I saw, well, there's Lee you know, walking during that, you know, with his muscles and stuff. <laughs> he, was a, he was a pretty good guy. So, so, so do you want to have something? Yeah, I just wanted to add something for to Mel's question. Uh, we were there at the celebration of the Mary Hill Day about a couple of years ago, and they did open a component of the museum oh. that on the day part of the celebration. Oh, nice, okay. Yeah, Vince Reyes. <laughs> I was on the tape manual. I haven't seen you guys for decades. Oh, you, you're Vince? I don't recognize you. <laughs> I just wanted to. on here about 10 times. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was the latest iteration. Oh, Vince is going to be here. I'm going to add him in. It's amazing to look back, and I'm glad you captured it. I didn't know you guys were filming. That's quite amazing. Well, honestly, I forgot we did. You know, I, I met uh, when they had a farm worker display at the state fair, Phil, uh, Liz's brother, he came up to me, you know, we were there, and he goes, oh, do you still have all those pictures and film from Ogbiney Village? And I'm thinking, what pictures and film? And then when I started going through these boxes of stuff, I go, oh, these pictures and film. So I forgot I'd even had them. It's 50 years ago. Yeah. So thanks again. Okay, thanks, Vince. Thanks for doing that movie. It's a great talk to you. But also, you know, when you were building this, No. No, back back then there was no well I think you had to really upgrade quite a bit to get sound. So we we were using both Super 8 and the regular 8 millimeter. And this the the film that I put on here uh, like I said, I didn't want to put too much of the roof because the other one, it's like you see the uh, watch a Western and then you see a guy right off into the sunset for like five minutes at the end of the movie. That's how a lot of the filming was. It's like I start the roof here and I just pan all the way across. Then I'd start over here and I'd pan all the way back. And 
So a lot of that I took out. Most of it, thankfully, I took out. So. Liz. Um, Because uh, 
I remember going into my, we found a place, they had found a place, and my mother was very excited because all she had known was living in the camp. That's why now we're going to this house. And uh, we were going to go in and, and, and sign the paper. But I went in with them into the real estate office and my, uh, and the uh, realtor said, oh, I forgot. We have to do a survey of all of the neighbors to find out whether it's okay with them for that age or And my mother, in her devastation, stood up and said, that's okay. We've changed our mind. And I remember writing back in silence. I um, never discussed it with my parents. They never told me. I, again, as Sam said, I put the things together. And I figured out what was happening in the time. I didn't have any thoughts from about how we couldn't find anything. My dad was the president of the little circle at the time. There were rooms there for some. And then others went on to other things. And, uh, and so forth. But that's the memory that hmm. I had. Oh no, that's okay. That's okay. Yes. Uh, uh, kind of an analogy. This this facility here is an extension of the Octagon uh, Village because you all. Hold on, I, I want to give him justice. This is Melody Gosk. He's one of the founders. <laughs>
But I also, on the last note, in July of 2017, there is a state fair, the California State Fair. In the first time in 164 years, the state fair finally acknowledged farm workers and did an exhibit in, in the, at the state fair level. Now they may have done it local level, but at the state fair level, the first time in 164 years that they acknowledged farm workers. And we live right smack dab in the, the agricultural capital of the world. So the agricultural uh, contributions to farm workers are extremely important. The work that they do is extremely important. And we not only keep this area, but we keep the world. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, just, just a couple of things you brought up about the State Fair uh, presentation in 2017. Liz actually was one of the presenters during, during the program. She got up and, and spoke in total. Talked about the history of her family as related to the uh, uh, farm workers. So Liz, you wanna raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> and just one other thing where you talk about talking to your families to find about Find out about the history of your family because it all melds into the history of the Filipino Americans in, in the United States. When I was growing up, we would go to all these parties and you know events at the American Legion Hall, and different people would get up and speak. Some of the old, we'd call them the old timers, or but we would tune it out. It's like, oh, they're speaking again. Let's, you know, I'm thinking about my next test at school. You know, I'm not paying any attention. And then, my, even when my dad would get up and talk, you know, I'd kind of tune it out. But during the whole time, I never really talked about, to him or my mom about their life. Just little bits and pieces here and there, but nothing, uh, not a lot. But it turned out at one of my, our, uh, we threw a 50, 50th anniversary for my mom and dad, and one of his friends got up and spoke and I did the same thing that when I was a teenager, I kind of tuned them out. And then my dad got up and spoke, and I tuned them out again. Well, it's been, that was in 1997. Well, probably five years ago, I found the, the videotape of the anniversary. And I actually listened to what the first guy, first gentleman was saying, and he was talking about the history of the Philippines. He was talking about the Manoms when he came. He was telling the story that we never really asked. And then after my dad got up and he was gonna say thank you for, for everybody coming, he said, uh, thank you everybody coming, but I wanna respond to what he said, because they were good buddies. And so my dad started telling his story. And it's like, I never knew any of that stuff. If we didn't videotape that, all of that would have been lost, and I never would have known that. And he had spent some time in Stockton, like during the, uh, the winter time. So one quick story, he would say that him and his friend, Martin uh, Mamuyak, they would rent a room in one of the hotels for 50 cents each. So it cost a dollar. They would go and they'd spend the night, and then, you know, when it got dark, there would be these five or six of their friends would sneak into the room. They'd sleep on the floor, they'd use the, you know, they were able to take showers. They'd sneak out the morning, you know, the next morning, and they would pay a quarter each. So now they made like, I don't know, $2. So the next night, they would rent another room for, 50, for a dollar, and another guy, so it was like a cycle. They would rent a room, their friends would sneak in, take showers, sleep. They'd leave, they'd each pay a quarter, because you know, they really didn't have a lot of money. And then the next night, so they would do that over, and that was one of the ways that I guess they survived. You know, instead of sleeping out on the streets, or, you know, because a lot of them weren't in the camps anymore. If the camps weren't working, they only had a few people there to be caretakers. So, anyway, that was a story that, unless we, 
If it wasn't videotaped, I never would have known that story. So there's a lot of hidden gems in photos and film that you might have at home that, you know, is part of the Filipino American history that would be important to try and, and uh, dig out, I guess. So. Any, any other last comments before we uh, end? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Salamina. Uh, yeah, okay. Lauren and I grew up um, in a farm labor camp in Delano. So we were really, we were always connected with the model of the field. And this is sort of connecting to the purpose of Akayani Village. They would run, you know, the, some of the camp guys, some of the mine would knock out the door and, and they would call my dad, Mina, 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 there's something in problem. So we, I, my mom said, go call your dad. So I, I called my dad and there was, there was a mine that uh, was dying in, in the barracks. And um, this particular mine was in Katipadia. He, uh, he was a really bright, educated, and, and he spoke the mantra of setting an education and succeeding in America. You want to compete in America, you've got to be educated. You know, the mantra that my parents would always uh, espouse. So he was just, and he was really cool. You know, he was really level-headed, cool. Talk, talk to everyone and I when we were growing up about, you better go to school, and just, just a cool guy. But, he, uh, he, had a, he, was dying, he was dying and he, he was hemorrhaging, so he was bleeding and the hospital was sending the ambulances and when he passed away, and I was in the, in the barracks with my dad, he passed away and, and I thought to myself, I was a kid then, and I was thinking to myself, is that it? You know, the old monos that we all talked to that lived and we took great with and did pruning and that's how they end. That's it. <laughs> and so the Akwayani village, you know, at least attempted to, to get people like Tatabia to have a, a dignified ending in their in their lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I you know, those, those are the you know, again another more reflection having grown up in a camp in early notes. There, there were so many occasions with dealing with the models and my dad was a foreman so we were always in camp with him. But we just uh, I thought I reflected how how Aquiati village mm. was such a, a good support system for especially the elderly models. You know, I remember the the young Filipinos when we would hurdle. Well curly was really hard we cut. It was like two and a half cents if you're lucky of so for those of you that don't know what hurdling is it's at a time in the a great life cycle is where, where you cut the bark and what it does is it helps the uh, circulation and, and the uh, for super fruit. Yeah, so and it, it was really hard. You, you got to make two, two and a half dozen times. So all the young guys like me, you know, it was painful and, and really exhausting, but we could at least do it. The old guys, they had to, they had to be innovative. And, and so they had to create their own early time to do two hands, but very slow. So they didn't make the money like the young guys could. And so all the old models were just left behind. And, and so anyway, again, going back to the reality village, that, that really... Yeah, that's... Sam, yeah. yeah, you know what? My, my, my thoughts here are that June, she was, lived in the camps, and many of you as well. We, we chronicle this, and then you know we, you ha you have our our uh, email addresses. Let's let's uh, chronicle these things. And uh, the reason why I'm kind of rushing right now is we're running out of battery. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you everybody. And Thank you, Zahner. Oh, thank you, Zahner.